Good evening, everyone. How are you? Thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Sam Ankerson. I'm the executive director of the Bailey Matthews Shell Museum. And welcome or welcome back to the Celebrating 25 Years Lecture Series and tonight's program with Ken Sassaman, 8,000 Years of Shells in the American Southeast, uh, which I'm really looking forward to and um, delighted that you've all joined us um, tonight or this afternoon um, from all over the country and, and, and beyond as well. Um, very, very glad to have Ken here. He's a, he's a preeminent archeologist and um, has a, just an amazing perspective on this subject. I first, um, if you can see this, this is Forum Magazine, which is, which is published by Florida Humanities, a great organization. And um, picked up the spring issue earlier this year and read a fascinating article uh, by Ken about um, uh, the state's Florida's earliest inhabitants and the relationship between those peoples and the reality of climate change and, and rising seas. And it was just a great article. The whole, the whole issue of the magazine was, was devoted to water and a number of good pieces in there, including one by Cynthia Barnett, who uh, some of you may know from, um, from her participation in this lecture series earlier in the year and her involvement with the museum over the years, author um, on a variety of subjects that just come out with a terrific new book called The Sound of the Sea, Seashells and the Fate of the Oceans, which um, a lot of the research for which she did here at the museum, which just came out um, from WW on WW Norton, uh, their publishing house. But, um, but it turns out that um, in talking to Cynthia, that she and Ken Sassaman are, are friends and colleagues from the University of Florida. And so it's this nice kind of small world set of circumstances. And, um, and anyway, glad, glad that Ken is here tonight uh, for this presentation. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping notes um, before we start the presentation. If you have questions, uh, we, we welcome questions and we'll have a question and answer session uh, after Ken's talk. Um, but with your questions, just uh, type them in using the chat function, which uh, you can find along the bottom of your screen. Um, just scroll down there, you'll see chat, click on that and type in your question. I'll keep track of those and we'll, we'll do Q&A at the end. I see some of you have already discovered the chat function, so that's great. Um, so that's how we'll do questions, and I, I think um, um, I think the, all the microphones are muted. But um, but if you know if, if your microphone is not muted, if you could if you could do that, that would be great. We have a few more Zoom talks, virtual talks um, coming up as um, as part of this series, uh, which will continue through October. So the celebrating twenty five years series will continue through the end of October. And the next um, few talks we have coming up on September 16th, um, Dan Killam, a researcher at Bios Biosphere 2 um, out in Arizona, is, um, will be giving a, an intriguingly titled talk, Why Am I Growing Giant Clams in the Middle of the Desert? Uh, so that's on September 16th. September 28th, um, to uh, co-presenters who, who were with us for this series in June, uh, curators Jean Burks and Corey Rogers uh, will give a presentation on shells in jewelry and fashion. Um, they did uh, in June a presentation on shells in 2000 years of art, which was a great talk. And this is the follow-up uh, focusing on jewelry and fashion. That's on September 28th. In October, and on October 21st, our own uh, Jose Leal is giving a Halloween special kind of a talk called Spooky Mollusks and Other Evils of the Deep. So that's on October 21st. More information on all of those is on the museum's website. They're all free um, via Zoom. And uh, that will round out the Celebrating 25 Years series. And then we'll pause for a couple of months and then look to, in January, uh, begin our 2022 um, season lecture series with, and our plan is for it to be a combination of in-person lectures and, and with an online component as well. So stay tuned for that. We're planning the speakers now and um, 
and we've got some very exciting folks lined up, but waiting for it all to get to um, all get wrapped up before we announce the whole series. Um, okay, then on to um, on to introduce our speaker tonight. So Ken Sassaman is the Hyatt and C.C. Brown Professor of Florida Archaeology at the University of Florida. He specializes in the archaic and woodland periods of the American Southeast, technological change, and community patterning. Since arriving in Florida in 1998, Ken spent most summers in the middle St. John's River Valley of Northeast Florida, where he and his students investigated the region's oldest shell mounds. In 2009, he launched the Lower um, Suwannee, or, I hope I didn't mis mispronounce that, Ken, <laughs> <laughs> um, archaeological survey on the northern Gulf Coast of Florida to investigate a record of maritime living that continues to be diminished by rising seas. Um, and just right, last thing before I uh, before I welcome Ken to the virtual stage, I just want to um, share something which I just love, which I learned about two hours ago, um, which is that uh, Ken does not have a cell phone, which I think is the most terrific, <laughs> magical thing in this day and age. And um, in addition to all his accomplishments and accolades and everything. I just um, applaud uh, applaud that um, in, in a big way. So <laughs> thank you, Ken, uh, for being here tonight. And with that, um, we'll welcome you to the uh, the e-stage. Well, thanks, Sam, for that lovely introduction. And I hope everyone can hear me just fine and see the PowerPoint that I'm sharing with you. Um, let me first say uh, happy anniversary. 25th anniversary to the Bailey Matthews um, National Shell Museum, and many more anniversaries to come. Um, I'm here to tell you about shells in deep time. I'm an archaeologist, and I've been one for getting on 40 years now, kind of scary. Um, and I've worked primarily, almost exclusively, in the American Southeast. And I would say that the bulk of that has been digging through shell. Um, and so, like most archaeologists that experience excavating in shell, I've come to have a love-hate relationship with shell. Let me tell you about the hate part first and quickly. That's just the physicality of dealing with shell. Digging through shell like you're seeing in this slide, that's actually shell that's deposited at a place called Shell Mound, just north of Cedar Key. It's tough work. It's often very compacted, uh, quite often just massive in scale, you know, many meters deep tens if not hundreds of meters wide and, and long. Um, and that, that's, that's part of the challenge. And then the, the other one that all, all the archeologists uh, in North America have to deal with is the, the legalities of curation. We dig up all this shell, what are we gonna do with it all? And it's always been a dilemma because um, shell has a tremendous amount of analytical value, but after you collect, you know, say several hundred square or cubic meters of it, do you have enough? Um, well, that leads to the love part. So the love part of shell is that it's probably the single medium that I deal with as an archaeologist uh, that has the greatest potential or, or capacity for addressing a wide variety of questions, everything from environment to ritual. And so what I want to do today is just kind of give you a, a smorgasbord of what archaeologists have learned about shell from different perspectives. And none of this is going to be terribly um, detailed or nuanced. Uh, I want to cover a lot of ground rather than drill down deeply into one specific aspect of it. So my four topics are ecology, diet, architecture, and ritual. And we'll take them in that order. There's a lot of cross-referencing that you'll see along the way, but I'm just going to try to keep this as simple as possible. And here we go. I can get this thing to advance. There we go. Let me start by telling you about the oldest shell deposits that we know of in the southeastern United States. I want to restrict my discussion to that. That's really the area that I know best. But it actually goes back pretty far, at least 8,000 years ago with respect to freshwater shell deposits. This is an example of one in northern Alabama excavated during the Depression under the Works Prog Progress Administration. Um, a lot of the sites were excavated in advance of damming rivers like the Middle Tennessee which is being dammed here, uh, uh, or is dammed shortly after this excavation in the 30s. And um, at the time, there wasn't radiocarbon dating, so no one really knew how old these were. There was a pretty good idea that they were ancient, 
but how ancient was uh, something that wasn't understood until we had means of dating these independently with uh, the geophysics of, chem of, of radiocarbon. So they go back about 8,000 years ago. They're mostly unionids, freshwater clams, mussels, but also in certain areas like Eastern Tennessee and particularly in Florida, um, a variety of pond snails in Florida, viviparous is the genus that's most common. We'll talk more about them later. And then also the apple snail in Florida, Pomacea, the genus Pomacea. So it's, a, it's an ancient record. It's not continuous, but there's a period of, uh, you know, between about 3,500 and 2,500 years ago. I'll tell you about later where we kind of lose sight of human use or, or dependence on shellfish. Um, not that they went away. The shellfish were still there, but people tended to turn away from them during that millennium. We don't, really don't know why. We'll get back to that later. The coast is a much different story. On the coast, we have uh, what's called a truncated record. So it goes back at least um, 5,500, but we really don't pick up a consistent pattern of the human use of shellfish and its deposition on the land until about 4,200 years ago. And that also continued to about 3,500 years ago. And then we lose sight of human use of shellfish for several centuries, if not a, a complete millennium, a thousand years. So it looks like it's late. In the early days of archeology, span this was taken as tacit evidence that shellfish were added late to the diets of people of Eastern North America. And if you think about that logic, why would they be added late if they were always available? One of the conclusions, erroneous conclusions that people reached was that it was not very desirable, right? That shellfish were somehow a secondary or tertiary resource, didn't have a lot of food value, didn't have a lot of taste value. Uh, looking at it from a modern perspective, you know, I'm dumbfounded, right? Because nothing better than a raw oyster for me, uh, and certainly a lot of other shellfish can be quite tasty cooked with butter and garlic, right? So uh, it's kind of hard to fathom that archaeologists would have come to that, but the record was truncated, so they didn't know of anything earlier than 4,200 years ago. The idea now is that it, it's the point of visibility because of sea level rise, but there's still this ongoing debate about whether or not before 4,200 years ago, the conditions were in place for supporting productive, exploitable shellfish resources like oyster reefs, oyster beds, things like that. Um, when we do look at sea level rise, this will promise the only diagram I'm going to give you that has a lot of scientific uh, evidence behind it. But you probably know this, that when humans arrived here about 15,000 years ago in Florida, uh, the coast uh, where you are would have been central Florida. Sanibel would have been central Florida. The coast would have been uh, a couple hundred kilometers to the west. My study area there at the mouth of Pawnee River, that circle you see in red there, that was about 250 kilometers from the shoreline when humans arrived. So the, the graph on the right shows the rise in sea level since that time. And here's when people arrive. And then this line here marks the point where the rate of sea level rise became subdued. It started to plateau. So over the last 5,000 years or so, the rate was so slow that um, it was hard to measure in real human time. And I think most people experiencing life on the coast between 5,000 years ago, right on up till today, have a hard time understanding over the course of their, of their life, say 60, 70, 80 years, that there's been dramatic change in sea level. Boy, if you were living down here, if you came in at 14,000 years ago, your coastal site as a child would be underwater by the time you were five years old, right? And another five years, it would be underwater. Another five years, it would be under. You would constantly be relocating landward as water rose and, and the shoreline transgressed over land. So this is a complex problem because it certainly uh, explains why we don't see shell fishing before 4,200 years ago. It simply would be underwater today in marine water, in the ocean and in the Gulf of Mexico. But it also affects artesian flow of groundwater. So as sea level came up, it, it got to the point where the pressure of fresh water above, which is coming down mostly from precipitation, would be uh, extruded at places like uh, the vents of limestone. And we know and love today as the, the magnitude, the first magnitude, second and third magnitude springs of Florida, right? They issue a lot of fresh water to the surface from the ground, ultimately it has to do with the pressure of water deeper below. Uh, it also has effects on river systems. So as, as, as oceans come up, 
they changed the baseline, the difference in elevation between the headwaters of a river and where it dumps into a body like the Gulf of Mexico or the Atlantic Ocean. So all this comes into play, but really what we've come to understand is that that yellow line is only the point after which we see visibility as archaeologists. And what we know now is that shell fishing goes back at least to 8,000, if not 10,000 years ago, definitely in freshwater environments like the St. John's River Valley, places like the Tennessee River Valley, but I think also offshore underwater, and that's really the big frontier in Florida archaeology. How much was going on between 15,000 and 4,000 years ago along the coast that is now underwater, and uh, if it's preserved, how do we find, how do we, how do we uh, investigate them so we can collect information about what environmental conditions were like and so forth? So sometimes uh, big things come in little packages. And years ago, one of my grad students working with Bill Mark Hart and Karen Walker at the Florida Museum of Natural History turned us on to this idea of looking for these little minute snails under the genus of Truncatella. So Truncatella is a really minute thing, as you can see, and it has this very specific niche probably the most specific niche, I don't really know shellfish the way that most of you do, but I think it's the most specific niche of the shellfish the Native Americans used. Um, in fact, it's not, it's not, it's more of a proxy for environment than it is anything they would use. It may have been wrapped up in the seaweed that they collected and brought back to their campsites, but that's their niche. It's the rack zone of the high tide line of uh, Gulf Coastal, Atlantic Coastal environments in Florida. So these are basically tracking sea level in archeological context. To give you one example here, these are offshore islands, North Key and Seahorse Key, uh, just offshore from the town of Cedar Key. This is the Northern Gulf Coast of Florida. I'm sure most of you know about Cedar Key if you haven't been there, great place to visit. The archeology span is spectacular. Off on these islands, we have these stratified shell deposits and after we excavate them, we, of course, sort everything into the respective shell taxa. We get out the vertebrate fauna. We get out the charcoal for dating. We separate the pottery and the stone tools and so forth. Well, when we look at Truncatella, this is what this blue line indicates, the number of Truncatella per liter. We can see they really don't show up until after 2,400 years ago. Even though we have a 4,000-year-old occupation here at the base, another one here at the base, we don't see these shelling up until after 2,400 years ago. So this ends up being a proxy, this little inconspicuous minute marine gastropod, a great kind of clue as to changing water conditions along the coast there. We're working on a paper trying to integrate this with our archeology span better. Um, and so stay tuned for that. Hopefully we'll have something more scientific to share with you in about a year. Another interesting ecological puzzle is the appearance of these elongated freshwater gastropods this is the dominant species of the shell deposits along St. John's. The genus is viviparous. The species is Georgianus. The common name is the banded mystery snail, which sounds really mysterious, of course, but it ultimately is a, a really prolific filter feeder in a lot of the freshwater biomes of, of Florida, particularly in the St. John's. But in excavating at a place called Silver Glen, which is off the southwest corner of Lake George, and I'll get back to that later and show you what the archaeology there looks like, we encounter these elongated versions of this taxon, of this species. And the first thing we did, of course, was rush to the specialist who said they had never seen them before, and they're not quite sure what to make of them. Are we looking at a different species? Are we looking at a subspecies of Georgianus? Are we looking at a secular trend? Are these simply Georgianus that had environmental conditions that enabled them to grow or caused them to grow to this morphology, this attenuated sort of cone-shaped morphology? This all happened, we know, between 3,500 and 2,500 years ago. And I've already mentioned, this is like a mysterious millennium for us. We know that there's massive environmental change. We're not quite sure what happened. The leading hypothesis is that we had a period of global cooling, unlike the warming we're having now, and that water levels actually went down as ice was trapped in alpine and, and polar caps, right? So my grad student, Anthony Boucher, he's the one here in the middle at the end of this core. We're out there in Lake George just a couple months ago, taking geological core samples of the nearshore deposits, looking for this missing millennium. And we may have found it, 
although we still have to do some searching for intact deposits. What you see here in this core is the upper portion is redeposited material dating to that time period, but it's not in its original position. It's been, it's been eroded and then redeposited elsewhere. The, uh, the upshot here is that that deposit is probably out deeper in the water, further out into the water of Lake George. So we know that we have bathymetry, which is you know underground topographic mapping that shows some possibility of shell mounds that are completely inundated now that would have formed between 3,500 and 2,500 years ago. This would explain why we don't have much purchase on human habitation at this time, because it, like the really old stuff of the, of the late ice age and early post ice age, is underwater, right? I'm a landlubber. I'm not interested in putting scuba tanks on, but I do have grad students that are intrepid like that. And hopefully we'll figure this out for you uh, next time I come to talk. Let's turn to diet. Well, who doesn't love shellfish? Uh, I know a few people, but I think they're kind of weird. Uh, I think shellfish are incredibly tasty. They can be cooked in, in a variety of ways, and they're really nutritious, right? They're not to be all and end all. You couldn't live, there's not complete protein there, perhaps. Uh, you couldn't live off these alone, but they certainly are a, a great resource for people to take advantage of. They're stationary. They can be highly productive. They're not that difficult to collect under most circumstances. And they can be eaten raw, but you can easily steam them, roast them, do any number of things to them. So the questions here aren't, did people eat them? Certainly they ate them. But how important were they to Native diets, Native American diets? Were they year-round fair or only seasonal? And then in a similar vein, were they, were they daily fare, something you might eat any old day of the year, or were they relegated and, and kept for special occasions, like large-scale feast, for instance, right? These are interesting questions, and they can be answered with archaeological evidence, not only of the shell itself, but the technology used for collecting them, processing them, and consuming them, right? And that's, archaeologists have, you know, we have access to that kind of information. Now, if you just judged it from the size of the, some of the mounds, you may know Turtle Mound, for instance, um, on the Indian River near New Smyrna Beach. It's massive. Many mounds across the eastern United States, particularly in the southeast, are just mind-boggling in their scope. They're just so big. Uh, Shell Mound, where we work north of Cedar Key, we've estimated there's 1.1 billion oyster shells in there. And, and that's not even the biggest, right? So uh, judging from the size alone, you might think the answer to the question, how important were shellfish to, to Native Americans in their diet? The answer would be really important, a staple, so much so that um, they were accumulating shell at a rate that led to these large refuse piles or mounds. All that needs to be looked at critically, though, because one thing, which is quite obvious, the inedible portion of sh most shellfish taxa, like an oyster, um, or even mercenaria, you know, a hard clam, uh, is, is shell and it's inedible, right? So the shell, the inedible part, the shell itself, makes up way more volume than the edible portion that was consumed presumably by people. So we got to keep that in mind, right? It's misrepresenting that. We actually have the same problem with like mammoth or mastodon. The bones are so big that when you see a bed of bones dating to the late ice, the ice age, late Pleistocene, you might think, my God, this is like their staple and so forth, but it, it kind of overrepresents the scope at which it may have been consumed. The other one is quite obvious, and we're going to talk about it here later, is that shellfish weren't just simply a source of food, but a raw material, the shell itself, a raw material for building uh, architecture, and it was used for all sorts of tools, and it was drafted into ritual purposes. And then is, if it was used uh, as, for a food source, it could have been food for, for bait, you know, used as bait for trot lines and traps for catching fish like, you know, catfish, right? So we don't always know that human consumed them. They certainly did consume it. We know that from the geochemistry or the biochemistry of their skeletons. Uh, the work that was done years ago shows that kind of evidence. Uh, and then, you know, I think we do see it modified in ways that it was burned or steamed or even, you know, just shucked raw that would suggest that ultimately they're after the edible portion there. Now, here's the thing that's part of the love affair that archaeologists have with shell. It's a big deal. 
shell preserves organic matter in a way that otherwise would not survive the ravages of time. And by other organic matter, I mean things like the minute bones of fish or seeds, uh, other plant matter, charcoal, nutshell, and then in some cases, you know, remarkable stuff like fabrics and so forth that, that humans made. What it does is it neutralizes the acid in the soil, the calcium carbonate. So when we have shell, uh, we're, we're obliged under modern ethics to recover the matrix, at least a portion of it, using uh, fine recovery methods. Things like window screen or at least eighth inch uh, hardware cloth or flotation devices where we lose virtually nothing. The reason we do that is because the preservation is so good that we're gonna find the really minute stuff that archeologists of yesteryear would have never even have noticed as they dug through shell deposits. They would have been shoveling, not even screening and only picking out large things like these deer bones that you see in the bottom right. But when we do find screen, we get all the minute stuff and it really slows down the archeological process because it takes a tremendous amount of effort not to dig it up, that, that one might only take an afternoon, but it might take 100 hours in the lab to sort that matrix and another 100, 200, 300 hours for a specialist to identify everything down to the taxa. Well, these are some of the ones we find on the Gulf Coast. Mullet's really popular, Jack, uh, the drums, of course, a lot of catfish, flounder. We get a wide variety, uh, but we wouldn't have any of it if it weren't for the shell. So it does this double duty of telling us something about how shell was used by people. It also creates the preservation regime in archaeological deposits. Now, the big fish that I just showed you, uh, they show up just like the little fish do in well-preserved context. But one of the things that's important about looking at where the big fish show up is are the contexts indicative of activities or events that were beyond the everyday uh, affairs of people, the stuff you would eat every day, for instance. So to cut to the chase, are we looking at large fish, for instance, being the fare of uh, social gatherings, feasts, where people would get together for purposes other than uh, daily living, you know, special events, solstices, equinoxes, marriages, rites of passage, things like that. Well, the same goes with the shellfish, that we find shellfish everywhere at some of these sites, but sometimes we find these pockets where it's almost exclusively shell. You see this, this one here in the middle is particularly bright in color. Below it is just, you know, really dark, what we call midden soil, a lot of organic matter. There's shell in here, sure, but a lot of charcoal and bone and uh, nutshell and things like that. And then above is kind of a mixture of the two, right? When you look at this one in the middle though, there's something peculiar about it, that the shellfish that came out of here aren't your everyday shellfish. They tended to be bigger and cuppier. And they also had these properties that my graduate student, my former graduate student, Jesse Jenkins, was able to document archeologically for a master's thesis. That was that this deposit had 70 or 80% left valves and only 20% right valves. And that's pretty unusual. Usually they're 50-50. If you're gonna shuck oysters and just throw them over your shoulder as you eat them, you're gonna end up with an equal ratio of right and left valves. Well, the left valves hold the meat when you have oysters on the half shell. And this is the flatter part here. So with Jesse, in talking to people that do oyster mariculture, Jesse found out that if you were gonna work with natural materials, this makes a really good, the, the right valve makes a really good material for enhancing um, and embellishing the oyster reefs from which these oysters came. And these are all subtidal oysters. They're not intertidal. They're not exposed during low tide. They're coming out from the reefs. They're coming from the beds. They're completely subtidal. So putting them back would have been helping to build and to maintain the reefs for spat for the next generation of oyster. And then the other thing she found out was that a lot of the attachment scars, like you see here, and they're blown up here for you, they have the perforations of sponges, much like the rest of the shell. And this is not unusual. Sponges in subtitle context here hang on to oysters anchors so that they can go about their lives. They're not, you know, they're not parasitic in the sense of killing the oysters off. They're just hanging on to the oysters so that they have you know, a firm substrate for, for getting on with their, their business of filter feeding or whatever they do. I don't really know that much about sponges to tell you the truth, but I do know they put these holes through here. 
So what Jesse is able to show is that only in this deposit here do we have a high incidence of sponge holes on the attachment scars as well as the rest of the shell. So what is this telling you? It's telling you that they were calling oysters from clusters and taking off mature individuals, bringing them back to camps to consume, but leaving the clusters in the subtitle environment in which they were first found so that they could continue to grow and propagate. Otherwise, the scars, the attachment scars would never have been exposed to the boring capacity of these sponges. So here they're shelling and here they're calling. And Jesse puts this together to argue that under the circumstances of large social gatherings, we have evidence for uh, this sort of mariculture. All right. So the upper stuff, let me get to this point, we'll transition into architecture. You may have noticed the dates here, AD 545 to 645, so about 1,500 years ago. And then below that, an older date, more like 16, 1,700 years ago. But look at this. We're actually back to an older date on top. This is called reverse stratigraphy. And for an archaeologist, this is often a nightmare. It means that the site's been disturbed, that deeper deposits have been thrown on top of shallower deposits and it's reversed the sequence of age, not in the activities of piling it on top, but in the age, uh, the age of the shell itself, right? When it was taken out of the water. So this is telling us that shells being used for architecture because what's happening here is that the native inhabitants here at AD 500 roughly modified the site by taking existing shell and throwing it on top of freshly deposited shell. Well, that gets us to the third topic here, shell architecture. This is pretty dramatic, and I think uh, really an eye-opening uh, experience for me over the last 20 years has come to understand that a lot of the shell mounds throughout the eastern United States, particularly in Florida, were constructed, and not just simply the consequence of people, you know, depositing shell under their feet for hundreds, if not thousands of years. So this wonderful artistic impression of life of the Calusa on Pine Island, you see these wonderful platform mounds that are made out of shell. And I think it was, it was easy for people just to assume that that was a consequence of living there. But what it shows us now, based on you know, excavations, again, Bill Marquardt, Karen Walker, other people that have delved into this uh, for decades now, that these things are deliberate constructions in many cases because we see things like reverse stratigraphy, that they're using existing shell deposits as raw material and mobilizing that for building um, platforms for houses and various other architectural um, components. So perhaps one of the best examples of this is south of where you all are in Sanibel, down in the 10,000 island area of Southwest Florida. The work of Mar Margot Schwadron at the National Park Service has been to document a lot of these shell work complexes in places that otherwise would not have been inhabitable. Uh, even 4,000 years ago, they would have been just too wet. These truly are examples of what we call terraforming, which is building inhabitable spaces in places that in this case were just too wet and certainly too dangerous to be in with things like tidal surge and so forth. So we got ridges, we got rings, we got these fingers that stick out into the marsh that look like it's a marina. I mean, to me, this looks like the plan for like the next big marina to be built in Southwest Florida. It's going to have houses along the ridges and you have your boats tied up to all these, these piers and so forth. And then this, this one piece of architecture here is really curious because it's a ring. It's open to the north, but it's quite large, right? We're looking at something that's, that, that's really uh, pretty extensive here, tens of meters across. Well, this is part of a tradition that started at least 5,500 years ago, really took off about 4,000 years ago, and then kind of disappeared about 3,200 years ago. It's the shell rings of the Atlantic and the Gulf. The biggest ones are in Florida. As you can see here in this diagram, all the ones on this top uh, segment here are uh, four or five times bigger than the ones in South Carolina and Georgia. This is a topic of ongoing, heated, lively archeological debate. What exactly are these things? Most of us, myself included, would suggest that these are relatively permanent residences of people living in the round, they were also places of gathering where there was a lot of feasting taking place. Becky Saunders from Louisiana State University, Mike Russo from the National Park Service, really good evidence they've accumulated that there's feasting events that took place here involving oyster and other marine taxa. So that's, that's a big architectural element of Florida and the greater Southeast. 
It was also used for practical purposes. So a fish trap that we know of just north of Cedar Key has two oyster shell walls that enclose these tidal pools that may or may not have been modified by people. We know this dates to the same time as the feasting of the site I showed you with the mariculture of oyster. So it's about 1500 years ago. We thought maybe these were storm surge deposits because when you look at the upper portion of them, it has that shell hash that you find in the intertidal zone of, of, of uh, you know, in this case, the Gulf facing uh, landforms. But when we poured it, what we found below that was intact oyster shell in muck that was uh, again in reverse stratigraphy laying on top of a fine sand. So we're pretty confident this was actually emplaced by people 1500 years ago to enhance the uh, functionality of these tidal pools for a fish trap. We know from evidence elsewhere, just to the north of this, that this is probably being used for the feast that took place during the summer solstice. Um, the article that Sam mentioned in the Forum magazine talks about this a little bit. We got that nailed down pretty good thanks to the help of the white ibis, which we recovered from these deposits. But the number one taxon that was probably trapped in here was mullet, which, which was being consumed uh, literally by the thousands for every one of these events that took place in mid to late June. The shell mounds of the middle of St. John's have a, a plethora of architectural elements. Unfortunately, most of these were destroyed in the last century, uh, early part of the last century. Um, the one you're seeing here in the 1950s was kind of the last gasp of shell mining. The shell was taken for a lot of road fill in Volusia County and elsewhere in Northeast Florida. It was also used as fertilizer. It was used for tabby construction, things like that. Um, the bias here, when people were mining these things in the early 20s, for instance, there wasn't really widespread knowledge that these things were, were uh, even archeological, let alone meaningful. In fact, it was the 1870s when a guy came down from Harvard by the name of Jeffries Wyman, who published a first paper saying, you know, the scientific community's got to rethink these shell deposits. They're not just, you know, relic fossil beds. They're archaeological deposits. They contain burials. They contain all sorts of, of food remains, house floors, evidence of horrors and things like that. So uh, there was an appreciation, certainly among the antiquarians at the time, that these were meaningful places and had a lot of potential. But for a burgeoning economy in Florida and the expansion of colonial, colonial settlers, uh, this was raw material for construction. And in that sense, there's some symmetry there between their, uh, their forebears of Native American ancestry and, and their ambitions going forward. The one place I want to show you in greater detail is Silver Glen Run, which is a first magnitude spring here um, in Marion County that dumps out into it crosses Lake County about the borders right about here and goes into Lake County, then dumps into Lake George. So when I showed you that coring we were doing was just over, over here to the north. And um, we've been working here doing field schools here for about a decade or so on property of the Juniper Club, which is the southern portion of the run here. The property to the north here is federal land. It's the U.S. Forest Service and it's open to the public. This is a recreational area. We've also done survey and excavation here at the behest of the Forest Service. So this is what the landscape looks like the day after mining in 1923, and then again in the late 40s around this area here. But this is what we think it looked like before the mining, thanks to the observations of Jeffries Wyman in the 1870s. So it's fading in, and what you're gonna see is this massive U-shaped ring or uh, semicircle uh, to the Northeast as well as a series of ridges on either side of this. And then a big amphitheater of shell, the way uh, Jeffries Wyman described it, an amphitheater of shell surrounding the boil. This ended up being a mortuary complex. So there's lots of human interments in here, but we understood this to be through our investigations of what's left of it, not much is left of it, but this was a major place of social gathering for people as far south as where you are in Sanibel. And I know a lot of you aren't in Sanibel, those of you in Sanibel, where the museum is, of course, we have uh, good evidence from the clays that were used to make the pottery that we had visitors coming from as far as Southwest Florida. We don't know when here, uh, over the period of a, maybe a few centuries between 4,000 and 3,500 years ago. A lot more I could tell you about this, but just one of the examples of a lost landscape 
And by the way, this is the locus of the opening scene of the yearling, Marjorie uh, Kennan Rollins' Pulitzer Prize winning book, when, uh, when Penny Baxter's uh, coming back from the war to return to his, his place, he talks about going back to the beginning, going back to the origins. Well, she writes as if this was a pristine landscape and unbeknownst to her, she, you know, she wasn't aware of, of the archeology span here that 4,000 years ago, this would have been uh, akin to New York City, right? A, a Mecca of activity not a, a quiet, pristine place waiting for Europeans to show up. Okay, my last topic in the, in the few, last few minutes that we have here is Shell as a ritual medium. This is quite evident in the ethno-historic accounts of Native North America, that Shell had tremendous spiritual value. It was a medium of transcendence. Archaeologists have probably known this as well, but they don't talk about it as much because it's hard to substantiate how people would have regarded shell as a ritual substance. You know, we can certainly talk about a diet. We can see how it's used in architecture. We know that it's used for tools and so forth. But what did it really mean to Native peoples in a spiritual or even a cosmological sense? Well, we can start with the burials for one. The earliest shell deposits are associated with burials. That is a categorical fact. There's no argument about it. And it's at the base of some of these shell deposits in places like the Middle Tennessee River Valley of Northern Alabama. There are human burials throughout these shell deposits, which led the early excavators to, understood, to understand them to be cemeteries, but there's also a lot of refuse of everyday living. So there was an argument for many decades that death was just, or the burial of individuals was just incidental, nothing special. But Cheryl Clawson at Appalachian State University was quick to point out in her research, uh, starting about 30 years ago, that the earliest burials at the very base of these deposits are pits that have shell with them. And it's not just humans, but dogs. So clearly shell was a medium of mortuary import. And I would say it's a medium of transcendence. I'll come back to that point here in a minute. We know shell was used for tools, no doubt about it. The ones on the left here, we got a lightning whelk at the top. We have crown conchs in the middle, and then we got a knob whelk at the bottom. Shell was drafted into tool use, but sometimes like the lightning whelk uh, shell on the right, I think that we have to seriously consider that the uses were not just mundane uses, but again, ritual uses. So for instance, in this one you're looking at on the right here, you can see it's been charred. And in fact, part of the world's burned out. So this was actually used directly over a fire and it was used as a vessel, right? So before there was pottery, this actually dates to 5,500 years ago, and it's from Salt Springs on the St. John's River. Before, it was, before they had pottery, they were using Khan like this, this is the lightning well, the large ones, as uh, vessels that could be used directly over fire. Well, you might say, well, geez, that's just a pre-pottery technology. That sounds great. But what we find associated with it is pretty unusual plant matter. In this case, there was an abundance of elderberry seeds that were associated with this. And we know elderberry from modern herbal medicine is a great remedy for a lot of things, but particularly it's good for boosting the immune system. In fact, my wife, who's an herbalist, has been giving me elderberry ever since COVID broke out. Uh, not that it would keep you from getting it, but it certainly helps your immune system fight against those insults, right? So uh, my point here is that I think Shell always had a quality of, of of spirituality or ritual or even a medicine capacity uh, that is belied by interpretations that simply see them as being used in mundane ways, like cooking a meal, for instance. The beads, of course, get us out of that conundrum because beads are not utilitarian ever. Um, they are, you know, in the mindset of modern people, perhaps jewelry, ornamentation, no doubt that was true as well. But Cheryl Clawson, the same person that figured out the importance of shell for the burials, would argue that, that shell beads were, were medicine, that they find shell beads most often on children that died, obviously, younger than they should have. And of course, the, the life expectancy in, in pre-Columbian North America was pretty short. It didn't mean people lived to be, it didn't mean that people didn't live to be 70 or 80. But this short expectancy because uh, infant and child mortality was really high. So the fact that we're seeing a lot of strings of, of shell draped around the necks of, in, of individuals as young as um, a few months or even a stillborn baby, right, 
and right on up through teenage years, the predominance or preponderance of Shell is found with young individuals would suggest to me, as it does to Shell, to Cheryl, excuse me, Cheryl, not Shell, that this is medicine, not just simply ornamentation. They're taking it into the afterlife, perhaps as a medium of transcendence, right? Well, real quick, Dan, we found a Shell production site recently, and it got some press a couple of years ago. My graduate student, Terry Barber, right here, is excavating at Raleigh Island, just north of Cedar Key, not too far from that other site I talked about in the fish trap. And he has the entire production sequence here, dating to the time when shell beads really became popular, the Mississippian period of 1000 AD until Europeans arrived. The big city of Cahokia, just east of St. Louis, uh, had no fewer than uh, 20 to 30,000 inhabitants. They were importing shell in large numbers and manufacturing beads. But here we have it at the source. Where the shell is coming from, the offshore islands like Seahorse Key near Cedar Key is providing the boozy con, the lightning whelk, that's being banged up with hammers on anvils and then drilled with stone drills to make these preforms, which are strung together and then run through an abrader like this that's grooved in order to get that nice symmetrical disc shape. This is his dissertation. He's underway. Maybe uh, down the road, you can convince him to come give a talk about shell beads during the Mississippian area era. Um, two other material culture items I want to mention quickly are gorgets, which are pieces of whorl that have been carved into discs. They're relatively flat. They can be um, a little bit convex concave, depending on what part of the world they're coming from, the size of it. But what's really spectacular about them, and we think these were worn around the neck as, as emblems, as, as symbols of, of all sorts of things. But we get this kind of difference between zoomorphic imagery, like you see on the left, and anthropomorphic imagery, like you see on the right, actual humans. And so Charlie Cobb at the Florida Museum of Natural History, among others, has talked about the difference between histories being told in mythological terms, which would be on the right, or cosmological terms, I mean, excuse me, which would be on the left with the animals or biographical terms or genealogical terms, which would be the example on the right there. Well, who are these individuals? Well, they're, they're probably the chiefs in many respects. This is an artist's rendition of what the chief of Cahokia, east of St. Louis, would have looked like uh, uh, roughly 900 years ago, AD 1100. And that imagery is engraved on this shell cup. We know these cups uh, occur in ritual deposits that are associated uh, with the remains of, of Ilex vomitoria, which is a holly made to use the black drink, which was used in rituals of renewal, world renewal, uh, primarily in the historic area during uh, the first harvest of corn. So sometime in late summer, for instance. So we're seeing uh, these images of cosmological uh, significance that are engraved in shell and it leads us to our last slide here, which is the cosmology of native people and the role of shell in that cosmology. So we know from ethnohistory that the world to native people is divided into three different spheres, an upper world, a lower world, and then the middle world of mortal creatures, right? Connecting those worlds is the axis mundi, which is represented sometimes as a cedar tree or just as a striped pole. And you can see the stripe, the cedar tree at the upper part in the upper world but it continues as sort of like a root, a tap root, as a striped pole. There's all sorts of really significant agents in this cosmology, but I don't really want to dwell on it other than to tell you that the shell kind of like transcends these worlds in a way that gave it uh, probably cosmological significance above virtually anything else. And that is that the shell is from the lower world, but the fact that it's piled up in mounds, you know, raised up high above the ground would suggest that it articulates with the upper world. Cheryl Clawson, again, from Appalachian State University says, the metaphorical equivalent to the shell are the stars in the sky. And then we have to get to the rotation, right? So we know the sun is moving from east to west across the horizon, if you're facing north, and that's the rotation of this cosmos here, that these worlds are in articulation with one another and they communicate with one another through the rotation of agents like the sun. You can see other ones that are moving through this counterclockwise. Well, the whirl of the lightning whelk, if you look at it face on with the apex away from you, 
you'll see starting at the middle that counterclockwise spiral that kind of symbolic re rep symbolically represents the communication between these worlds. It's all about balance. It's all about reciprocity. And ultimately, it's about how Shell was this medium that could bring about those conditions, which was really important in a world that was constantly changing. So Shell was really where it's at. I think it really gets, you know, um, underplayed as an important medium of ritual and cosmological import. It's 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 clearly doing more than serving uh, the purpose of diet. Uh, if nothing else, uh, certainly the architectural evidence I think is overwhelming that it was more than just uh, the remains of food. And I think I'll just leave it at that and open it up for questions. I've certainly had my 45 minutes or so, and I'd like to hear from you if you have questions, please. So I'm gonna stop my share. And I think right. Sam back. Yeah, sorry, hit the wrong button there. <laughs> Thank you very, very much, Ken. Um, Fascinating and terrific images. The, um, the engraved lightning whelk is, is totally stunning. Yeah. It was a really wonderful talk. And among the things I was thinking in, in, in listening and watching is just uh, in, you know, inspiring me to go explore parts of Florida where I haven't been before. I mean, you, you do really, really cool work. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it, thank you for, for sharing it, which I, I have one question. I know there are a couple of questions here, but um, I have one question, which is for, you know, for kind of the, the non-archaeologist, for the layperson, are there, are there places in Florida you'd recommend that are sort of worth visiting, um, whether it's related to um, the Shell Rings or the, um, or, or Shell Mounds, you know, places that people can go visit to um, see a little bit of this. I mean, here in Sanibel, there, you know, Ding Darling, there's a, there's uh, the Calusa uh, Shell Mound Trail. Uh, I just wonder if there are sites that you'd recommend. Yeah, it's kind of hard to beat what you all have right there in your backyard. Um, but but beyond that, uh, certainly, you know, there's plenty to see down there in Southwest Florida. What's near and dear to my heart, of course, is Shell Mound just north of Cedar Key. And it is on accessible uh, federal land. It's open to the public. And about three years ago now, with the help of the Friends of the Lower Suwannee National Wildlife Refuge, we installed 11 interpretive panels on a trail that takes you through Shell Mound and explains how we came to understand it to be a place of gatherings during the summer solstice. Uh, so again, it was featured in that, that forum article uh, as one of the vignettes. There's not a lot of detail there, but I do recommend that. I recommend you visit in the winter because the summer there has the terrible trifecta of the mosquitoes, the noceums, and the mm -hmm. yellow flies, okay. and it can be brutal. So often when we're out there, we're excavating out there, but it's funny when the visitors come, they'll start walking on the trail and quite often, more often than not, they'll start running and screaming and heading back to their cars. So please go visit in the fall, winter, early spring, something like that. Um, the St. John's doesn't have a lot other than Hontoon Island. And if you go to Hontoon Island, one of the intact freshwater shell deposits there is at the south end of the island. It's about a... It's about a 45 minute round trip from the north end where the, the ferry drops you off to the south end. But it's a nice trail, it's a nice nature trail. And then when you get to the end of it, it's pretty spectacular. You've been walking in this relatively flat terrain and then you rise up on top of this wonderful mound. And when you get to the far end of it, the south end of it, it's got this precipitous drop down into this wetland. So it's, it's, it's pretty dramatic, it's, it's nice to see. And that's for, both of those things are free of charge, right? You can just go do that. Nice. At your leisure. Nice. And Peter has a, a follow up question there, which is Are there any offshore archaeological sites? Yeah. And so this is, like I said at the outs outset, this is the final frontier in Florida archaeology. Maybe not the final frontier, but it's a big frontier. Um, there's very few people that are equipped and financed well enough to deal with offshore sites. But they are encountered, and the most recent encounter was right off the coast of Sarasota. Um, it was one of the pond burials, again, featured in that article I wrote in, in, in a four magazine. Pond burials date between about 9,000 and 6,500 years ago. In this case, this was a freshwater pond that was established about 8,000 years ago when sea level was down about 
five, six meters. So it's in 20 feet of water now, but it was freshwater then. And you can't see it. I mean, it's, it's pretty much off, off limits now. Um, but yes, they're there. And I have a grad student now that's mapping the drowned Suwannee River, the Paleo Suwannee, with the hopes of finding landforms along the drowned channel, like uh, point bars and levees and terraces, where he might expect to find archaeological deposits. He is a diver. Um, so he's willing to jump into that water and go find the stuff with a scuba tank. So yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And I wish I had more to tell you about it. It's out there but it's uber expensive to investigate, logistically very difficult. Right. Question from Ryan. I recently read about a Mayan site on Crystal River. Do you know if there was anything related to shells that helped identify the site as Mayan as opposed to other tribes? Well, it's not, it's not Mayan. There's no, there's no evidence of Mayan Florida period. There's speculation that the Maya came to Florida, and I don't see why they couldn't, because from the Yucatan to the Florida Peninsula by boat, it's, it's, it's not out of the question. I mean, it's technologically feasible. Um, but there, there is, there's a lot of idle speculation about that. What really started it were the two stelae made out of limestone that were erected at Crystal River in the plaza. And so when that was discovered back in the 50s, um, and they were erected, and you can see them there at the site now. There's a little placard that talks about them. They're pretty unassuming. They're just, you know, you got to kind of squint to see anything that's been carved into them. They're not the, you know, the, the wonderful stone carvings you see of the Toltec Maya or the Olmec or anything like that. So, no, those are the ancestors. We don't really know, but they're probably the ancestors of people of Tamuquin identity. And the Tamuqua, of course, didn't survive colonialism. So we have a hard time tracking that. But, um, but yeah, I, I, I can't, I can't endorse the Mayan thing. I'm sorry. I may be wrong. I may be proven wrong someday. And it wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me if the Maya made it here. We just don't have any, any direct evidence of that. Gotcha. That's a good question. That's a good question. Yeah. Um, one more question I see here. This one's from Mindy. How do you hypothesize that shells got from the Gulf Coast to Cahokia, Illinois, with so many different Native American groups who were not necessarily friendly with one another in between? Oh, yeah. Wow. That's, that's a good question. Okay, so let me tell you what the evidence is of Cahokia, and then the obvious evidence that it didn't come from anywhere near Cahokia. So Cahokia being a, essentially America's first city, it qualifies as a city in my book. It was dense, it was cosmopolitan, and it was planned. It doesn't have, uh, the, the people who lived there did not live in a state society like Sumer or ancient Egypt, or even like the Maya or the Inca, the Aztec, nothing like that. But they were a very complex society and quite numerous, right? So there was at least 20 to 25,000, some would say 50,000 people that lived there. In and amongst the city of Cahokia are these like craft barrios that have concentrations of lightning whelk that were being modified to make gorgets, to make those cups, and to make beads. They've been well documented, well studied by Laura Kosich, among other people uh, up in that neck of the woods. Now, that's a long ways from where they came from. No one could dispute that the shells coming out of the Gulf of Mexico. They didn't come out of Mississippi River. They didn't come out of Great Lakes. It came out of the Gulf of Mexico. There's no question about that. That's the long distance across a lot of terrain. At the time of Cahokia, we would be looking at several other polities, several, several other communities that were articulated with Cahokia through this political economy of exchange. So they may not have always gotten along, but there was this sort of like larger political economic structure in place that connected people along the way. Ultimately, because there isn't just one route there, I would assume that a lot of this was across land. So going across land, it gets to your question, you're no doubt gonna encounter people that aren't necessarily a part of this political economy or part of this community, this regional community. There is the possibility they paddled all the way west to the mouth of the Mississippi and then went up the Mississippi River all the way to Cahokia. The reason I say that's not out of the question is because we go back 4,000 years ago to Northeast Louisiana, there's a place called Poverty Point 
that has the highest concentration of soapstone anywhere in the Eastern United States, modified soapstone. The soapstone is coming from the Appalachians, Eastern Alabama, Western Georgia. So how did that get there? There's no evidence that it came directly across land, but there is a lot of places along the route south down the Chattahoochee Flint system, the Apalachicola, across the Gulf of Mexico, back up the Mississippi till they reach Poverty Point. So that's by canoe, right? So you can imagine that you got a lot of land to travel, but would you rather walk uh, 100 kilometers across swampy land and hilly terrain or paddle 250 kilometers uh, across navigable water? I think, you know, you know, you can carry cargo in a, in a canoe too. So they probably ended up paddling. So there's a long, a long answer to your question, but maybe it's all moot if instead of going across land, they simply just went by water, which is certainly plausible. I'll right. leave it at that. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Ken, again, for, for the presentation and, and the answers and, and everything. Thank you all for joining us tonight. And um, check out the museum's website for our upcoming talks and stay tuned to our social media and email for um, more announcements about those and then also the lectures that will be coming starting in January and have a wonderful rest of your week and um, and have a good night. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.